A massive shout out to the John and Tier member Mr. Leroy 1998 and Jen and Tier member and birthday girl Aliyah Rav. I hope you have an amazing birthday. Your support means a lot. If you would like your name mentioned in every video, as well as receive special perks and soon having early access to new series, consider becoming a member of this channel by hitting that join button. There's a rumor going around. If you like this video and subscribe you will find your Zanpakuto spirit, if you become a member you will find out your spirit will be Zanjetsu. Naruto sat down at Ikiraku's ramen stand, alone for the first time that day. It had been a tiring day, one filled with boring d rank missions and basic training. If Naruto didn't know any better, he'd say fate was conspiring to make his life hell. He glanced to his right, catching sight of a strange-looking person. Sitting in the seat next to him was a young man, probably in his late teens, with long red hair, resplendent in a rich, sapphire kimono. It was open slightly in the front, showing off a small portion of his torso. The bottom of his ribs and the whole of his stomach were covered in sarashi, the white, warrior's bandage. His hands and forearms were protected by samurai bracers, cloth bindings that were attached to the back of the hand by a thong looped around the middle finger. The man's violet eyes were sharp and cold, much like Sasuke's had been. A single, diagonal scar traveled down his left cheek, starting just in front of his ear, and ending near the bottom of his chin, beneath his lips. His mouth was a horizontal line, betraying none of the emotions flitting through his mind. He was a wall of solitude. Long red bangs touched his furrowed brow and jaw, the rest, which would have traveled a great distance down his back, tied into a high ponytail, as was common among some samurai. An average white obi tied the bottom of his kimono closed, wrapped around twice to make sure it stayed on. A katana and wakazashi were strung to his hip, sheathed in plain black scabbards. Naruto thought that such objects would be uncomfortable and cumbersome when sitting, but the man seemed to have no trouble at all. He looked perfectly content how he was. Naruto's gaze drifted to the man's pants, which were actually grey hakama, the pants of the samurai, most common with Roroni and Ronin. In the man's right hand were chopsticks, held in his dexterous fingers. The man's left hand held onto the edge of his ramen bowl as he calmly and slowly sipped the noodles, a glass of sake sitting not too far away. Naruto turned his head back around as his own ramen was laid out in front of him, steaming and fresh off the stove, so you're the one who's been following me. The man paused, gulping down the ramen in his mouth before he talked. He certainly had table manners, yes. Yes, I have, Naruto. Naruto broke his chopsticks, the man sounded just as he imagined he would, why? The man paused again, considering his words as he continued to eat, I've heard rumors of a cunning prankster who's managed to outwit several elite ninja. Normally, that would be reason enough for me to investigate. Naruto snorted, so, but there was more to the rumor, the man said, his voice as even and calm as ever, I heard that a six-year-old boy was the one pulling them off. Again, Naruto said, arching an eyebrow, your point. Someone like that deserves my attention, the man said, ignoring Naruto's sarcasm, I've never taken on an apprentice, but a Jinchuriki would make a most interesting student. Who told you? Naruto growled, nearly destroying his chopsticks. I know things that many others do not, the man said mysteriously, and I led my ears open to all things I hear on the street. Quote. Naruto slurped his ramen, cautious of the man, so, what are you going to do? The man stood, slapping some money down on the table, I'm going to teach you. Meet me at training area 12 tomorrow after your team's mission. Come alone. As the man began to walk away, Naruto shouted, wait. What's your name? The man paused, looking at Naruto over his left shoulder, Himura Batosai. Naruto could only stare as the odd man known as Himura disappeared into the night. His second chance was definitely strange. The next day, after an infuriating adventure finding Tora, Madam Shijimi's cat, two times in a row. Naruto walked into the clearing, his hands clenched tightly. He had to admit, he was a bit nervous about what this man, Himura Batosai, was going to do. He was in uncharted territory. Himura's expression hadn't seemed to change. His dark eyes were still cold and his mouth was still nothing more than a straight line. His hair remained the same. He turned as Naruto arrived, a katana grasped by the sheath in his right hand. He held it out as Naruto came closer, this is Masamune. You shall come to cherish it as you do your own life. You'll treat it as if it were your immortal soul. Naruto took it from Hamura's outstretched hand, 
running his fingers over the intricate dragon designs carved into the polished wood. He had been surprised by its weight at first, but it wasn't anything he couldn't handle. His weights were at an insane level, at least to him, Lee probably wouldn't think so, and Masamune really couldn't compete. At first, he was at a loss as to where to attach it to his person, since he figured it would take years to get used to having it hang from his shoulder or slung horizontally on his lower back. Since those were out, he decided to attach it to his unnoticeable belt, sitting comfortably on his left hip. When he was satisfied with its position, he turned his attention back to Himura, who stood patiently, what next? Next, Himura said, pulling his own sword from its sheath and grasping it with his right hand, I'll be showing you the basics of hidden Mishirugi Ryu. Naruto felt dread slide down his spine like icy water, cooling in his stomach. He had a bad feeling that he was going to go home more beaten than his escapade at the Valley of the End. In the end, his training was most enlightening, and he truly did enjoy it. But he had been so sore that it wasn't even funny. Well, okay, Himura had chuckled shortly when Naruto had complained of aches and pains. But to Naruto, it hadn't been funny at all. Naruto knew that his new training would pay off, probably pretty well against Zabuza, too. But that didn't mean he had to like the burning sensation in his muscles, or the sweat pouring off him in rivers. All in all, Naruto felt that things had been most productive, if quite painful. In the four weeks since he had met Himura Badosai, Naruto felt he had an ironclad grasp of the basics of hidden Mishirugi Ryu. They had hit some bumps and other obstacles here and there, it wasn't an easy thing to learn, but Naruto was quickly picking up skill with the sword called Masamune. After weeks and weeks of chasing the same cat, sometimes more than once a day, Naruto and Sasuke finally decided on something. They were tired of the same old boring mission. The aged Hokage's gaze traveled down the list of missions in front of him, let's see, Team 7, your next mission is. No, Sasuke and Naruto shouted in unison. We're tired of these easy, menial tasks. We want a C-rank mission. Naruto turned around, isn't that right, Hinata-chan? Hinata blushed, her head bobbing up and down. Very well, Naruto-kun, Sasuke-kun, Hinata-chan, the third chuckled, your task is the protection of a certain individual. The old man motioned to his Chunin helper, who escorted an old drunk in from the room next door. The drunk looked at the genin, then took a swig from his sake bottle. They look like a bunch of super brats, especially that one, he said, pointing to Naruto, he looks like he couldn't even lift that sword out of its sheath. He pointedly ignored the eyes trying to bore a hole into his skull, all six of them, taking another swig of his sake, I'm the super bridge builder, Tazuna, and I expect you guys to give me super protection until I complete my bridge. As Team 7 left the safety of Kanaha's gates, Sasuke and Hinata asked questions about Wave Country, Nami no Kuni. Naruto, who already knew the answers, ignored Kakashi and Tazuna as they gave the other two genin the information they sought. Naruto tensed for a second as they passed a puddle in the road. He knew what to expect, and this time, he would be ready. Last time, he may have frozen and got injured, but he had knowledge and experience on his side this time. He wouldn't be felled so easily as before. He wasn't disappointed. As soon as Kakashi's back was turned to the puddle, two figures rose from it, odd masks strapped to their faces. Their chain was soon wrapped around the gray-haired Junin and pulled taut, shredding him to pieces. Out of the corner of his eye, Naruto saw Hinata shiver when they laughed, Haha, <laughs> one down. They quickly dashed towards Naruto, who was grasping the hilt of his sword, prepared to strike him, two down, hehe. <laughs> a shuriken thrown by Sasuke forced one of them to slow for a second, allowing Naruto to unsheathe the Masamune. A quick, almost imperceptible slash shattered the chain between the two ninja, giving Naruto another direction in which to dodge. Naruto's moves were smooth and fluid, as he had been taught by his Kenjutsu swordsmanship teacher. Even in the heat of battle, his dodge to the left was graceful. A second flash of steel severed the respirator and the mist headband from the enemy closest to himself, and Naruto marveled at the strength of his blade. He had not only cut through cloth and plastic, but he had sliced through an iron chain like it was butter. Using his enemy's surprise to his advantage, Naruto quickly dismantled the claw on Gozu's hand with a third slash of his sword. Then, using butt end of his hilt, he knocked Gozu across the head, rendering him unconscious. Maizu, the second enemy ninja, made a dash towards Hinata after he dodged Sasuke's shuriken. He was so intent, 
so focused on what he saw in front of him, that he was unprepared for the harsh kick to the head that knocked him stumbling in Hanada's direction. Hanada, who had been able to anticipate Sasuke's attack, drove her open palm into Maitsu's stomach. With a surprised gasp and a painful grunt, Maizu collapsed onto the girl's shoulder, his body limp and harmless. He was unconscious. Hanada tried to push his lifeless body off her without flat out dropping him, a disgusted frown on her face, her Byakugan inactive. She found it difficult, his flowing dirty clothes tangling up with her taut, lean limbs and attempting to pull her down with him. Naruto and Sasuke couldn't help but laugh when she fell backwards, Maizu falling on top of her. It was quite comical, and even Tazuna couldn't help but chuckle. To see sweet little Hanada trying to untangle herself from an enemy she had felled mere minutes before wasn't something you saw every day. To see Hanada so frustrated was truly a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Finally, though, Kakashi, who had reappeared shortly after the battle had ended, took pity on the poor girl and pulled Maizu from atop her, laughing quietly. Naruto remembered the first time he had participated in the wave mission. He had been wounded, and, upon that wound, he swore he wouldn't run away ever again. He may have been preoccupied by it, but he still heard what Kakashi and Tazuna had talked about. It surprised him, this time, because the conversation, or interrogation, was identical even with all the changes he had made. As far as Naruto could tell, Kakashi hadn't noticed his eavesdropping, and if he did, he made no mention of it. But as the elite ninja walked over, a distinctly tired look gleamed in his eye. Despite the skill that Team 7 possessed, Kakashi still didn't believe that they were ready for such a hard mission. He's wrong, Naruto thought bitterly. He had been training since day one for the eventual battle between himself and the upper level ninja he would be up against. Zabuza and Haku wouldn't be the greatest challenge, but they would be strong. Gara would be very difficult, but he still wouldn't match up with Naruto, especially taking into account the Kyubi. Orochimaru would be the biggest challenge. Naruto might be able to get in a serious wound, because Orochimaru wouldn't be expecting so much skill out of the dead last of Konoha Ninja Academy, but the worst of the legendary three would most definitely trounce Naruto, despite any help the QB might give. Naruto, as he was sad to admit, wouldn't be able to pull out the Rasengan until the Chunin exam finals. Then, he would have an alibi. Its name, Jiraiya, sure, it would be hard to explain to the perverted sage just how he knew the Rasengan step by step, but Naruto was very good at lying. Kakashi's voice snapped Naruto from his musings, well, team, we have a choice. This mission is definitely B rank, bordering on a rank at the moment. We have the right to drop the mission and go back to Konoha right now if we want. On the other hand, we could continue the mission, but it'd be hazardous to our health. So which is it? Sasuke arched an eyebrow, are you crazy, Kakashi-sensei? After we've come this far, I'll never back down, Hinata said, glancing at Naruto for support, that's my nindo. Kakashi's eye swept over to the blonde ninja, who said, do you really have to ask? All right, Kakashi sighed, we're continuing the mission. Kakashi pinched the bridge of his nose as he turned around, tuning out the celebratory shouts and cries. Even though I have a really bad feeling about this. Thanks for everything, Tazuna whispered as he and Team 7 left the boat. He'd laid off the sake since the encounter with the Chunin duo. The ferryman shook his head, don't mention it, Tazuna-san. As they headed down the road to Tazuna's place of residence, they caught sight of the bridge. Sasuke let out a low whistle, so that's the bridge. Wow. I it's amazing, Hinata said, her eyes wide. Naruto grinned inwardly. He already knew about the bridge and its size. He'd fought on it after all. And how could he forget such an important part of his ninja career? It was where he fought his first major battle, and it was the first time he came close to facing a decisive loss. A thick fog rolled in as the group followed the dirt path to the little town in wave country, hiding the trees and bushes in a translucent haze. The wind was calm, and the only sounds heard were the soft clap-clap of the group's feet on the ground. Sasuke was the one to toss the kunai this time, and Hinata had promptly whacked him on the head for nearly killing a poor, harmless little bunny. Naruto had to stifle a laugh. Hinata was usually quiet and withdrawn whenever Naruto was near, and tried to be the best she could be. It was a change in pace to see her upset about something that seemed so trivial. The entire group suddenly ducked, Kakashi pulling Tazuna down with him, and the other three dropping to the ground on their own. 
a large zanbeitu, nicknamed kubikiri haucho, neck-cleaving kitchen knife, flew over their heads, embedding in a tree. As Tazuna and his entourage rose, a figure could be seen standing on the huge sword's hilt, his back to them. Momochi Zabuza, Kakashi hissed, hand flying to his headband. Junin of the bloody mist. He <laughs> he, you appear to be sharing in Kakashi, Zabuza said, chuckling evilly. Sorry, but the old man is mine. You'll have to get through me first. Kakashi growled, yanking his Hitai 8 skyward, revealing the coveted Sharingan eye. The Sharingan so soon, Zabuza cackled maliciously, it is an honor. Zabuza and his sword disappeared and the fog began to thicken. Kakashi backed his group into a circle around Tazuna. Surround and protect the bridge builder, he's way out of your league. Time to even the odds, Naruto muttered, slipping his weights into his backpack and dropping it. He was careful to set it down lightly, no need to draw attention to himself. His right hand held the hilt of Masamune, his left grasping the top of the sheath. His knees were bent, and his eyes blazing with the Sharingan. He was ready for the Su Ryu Sen, the twin dragon strike. To his left, Sasuke stood, his eyes alight with the Sharingan as well. He held a kunai in front of his torso, grasping it with both hands. His gaze darted around, no doubt, he was having just as much trouble seeing through the mist as Naruto and Kakashi. Damn it, he whispered hotly. Where is he? There was a sudden flash of sound from behind them, and Naruto had a good idea what it was. Hanada gasped, her Byakugan picking up on something they couldn't quite see. And Naruto-kun, Sasuke-san, he's, she was interrupted by a voice from directly behind them, near Tazuna. He he he, right here. Naruto spun on his right heel, chanting to himself, hidden Mitsurugi Ryu. With a flare of speed, Masamune flew from its sheath, aimed to slice Zabaza's head from his neck. Kubikiri Haucho was brought to bear, blocking the potentially lethal blow. Zabuza was smug. He <laughs> he, nice try, kid. Zabaza's eyes widened as Masamune's sheath came at him, colliding solidly with his arm, just beneath his right shoulder. He sucked in a breath of air, surprise written across his face. Gaiawa, Su Ryu Sen, grasping his shoulder with his left hand, Zabuza dropped his Zanbeitu, lashing out with a kick to Naruto's midsection. Naruto, who had expected Zabuza to burst into water, soared backwards, landing on his rear end a few yards away. Sasuke, who had attempted to tackle the missing ninja, and Hinata, who had tried to incapacitate him with a Juken strike, were both tossed aside like rag dolls. They were no match for the demon of the bloody mist. Naruto's head shot up when he heard Zabuza gasp again. Naruto's eyes widened. Kakashi stood behind Zabuza, a kunai stuck in the tan man's lower back. Water slowly flowed over the black metal, dripping to the hard ground. Suddenly, Zabuza exploded into water, splashing Kakashi's front. A second Zabuza materialized behind the leaf ninja, his sword prepared to swing around and cleave Kakashi in two. Kakashi sensei, the three genin yelled, S-P-U-R-A-S-H. Zabuza's sword cut Kakashi in half. Blood, bone, and flesh soon disappeared, replaced with a familiar clear-ish liquid. The Kakashi clone had reverted to water. Cold steel pressed against Zabuza's jugular. Another Kakashi stood behind him, sharing and whirling, it's over. Silence reigned for a few seconds, then Zabuza started laughing, it's over. Ha, you're right, Kakashi, it's over. S-P-U-R-A-S-H. Zabuza melted into a puddle, nothing more than liquid. Kakashi's eyes widened, a third Zabuza advanced upon Kakashi from behind, poised to swing his large blade. Kakashi ducked, but Zabuza seemed prepared for that. Using the momentum of his swing, he dug his sword into the ground, landing a roundhouse kick to Kakashi's jaw. The silver-haired Junin flew into the lake, soaked to the marrow. Zabuza was soon standing above him, making hand seals, Suro no Jutsu. A sphere of water rose up, surrounding Kakashi and trapping him in Zabuza's grasp. Using his free hand, Zabuza made a seal, now to take care of those brats. Mizu Bunshin no Jutsu. From the puddles of its predecessors, a water clone rose, no different than the real thing. It smirked at the genin, chuckling, you little punks don't know what it means to be shinobi. It was cut off as a black and gray blur came charging towards it. It was cut off as a black and gray blur came charging towards it. Clang. K-U-R-U-S-H-H-I-I-I-N-G. Masamune and Kubikiri Haucho clashed, sparks flying from their surfaces. 
K-U-R-A-U-N-G. Neither Naruto nor Zabaza's clones seem to be able to get in a solid hit, too evenly matched. Swoosh. The clone's sword cut through air, uninhibited by flesh or steel. Naruto had disappeared. Hidden Mitsurugi Ryu, everyone looked up to see Naruto descend upon the clone, his sword's handguard parallel to the ground. The clone could do nothing to prevent the sharpened metal from sinking through his skull. Ryu Sui Sen Zan, with a jerk, Naruto pulled his sword free and jumped back, watching as the clone dispersed into water again. Even the real Zabuza would have been hard-pressed to dodge such a surprising attack. Naruto's blazing red eyes turned to the Tan Shinobi standing in the middle of the lake. In a flash, Naruto was gone again, dashing towards the captor of his sensei. His moist sword glistened in the small amount of light visible through the mist. As the blonde came upon him, Zabuza jumped a slight bit backward to give himself some room. In a flash of gray, Zabuza's Zanbeitu was pulled from his back, swinging down to meet Naruto's Masamun. Clang. S-H-H-H-H-U-R-R-A-A-A-S-H-I-N-G. The two swordsmen clashed, attempting to push one another back. Naruto was putting up a good fight, but Zabuza, with his superior skill and bigger, heavier sword, was gaining an advantage. S-H-H-I-I-N-G. Naruto pulled his sword from the introverted tug of war, dashing out of the path of Kubikiri Haucho. Naruto was breathing heavily, but Zabuza seemed only slightly strained. Using his Sharingan to predict Zabuza's next move, Naruto bent backwards under the thick gray blade. Taking his chance, Naruto stabbed at the opening in Zabuza's guard, landing a painful, but shallow cut on the missing nin's left thigh. Zabuza cried out, back-fisting Naruto across the cheek. He flew sideways, landing headfirst against a tree at the shore. He was definitely unconscious. Zabuza's sword rose again, and he dashed towards Naruto's unmoving body. He snarled, you little brat. Wham, a roundhouse kick landed in his jaw, knocking him backward into a nearby tree. Kakashi stood, a glare fixed on his face, don't forget. I'm your opponent. Brat, without even looking straight at the beast, Naruto could tell that QB was upset. You're not going to lose to that weakling, are you? Even with all the training you did. He's a junin, even as the words left his lips, Naruto knew he was just making excuses. He's a lot stronger than me. QB snorted, that's bull. Naruto sighed, so what do you want me to do? Kakashi sensei can handle it. There are so many things I could say to that, the beast grinned. Its eyes gleamed maliciously, but I'll make it simple. Kick his ass. Naruto reeled back, he hadn't been expecting that, QB was usually somewhat calm and regal. He'd never heard it speak such vulgarities. I can't, he said. I'm trying to keep most things in the same time flow. If I don't, my memories of the future will become useless and obsolete. QB blinked, future memories. What are you talking about? Naruto gaped at him, his eyes wide, what? You mean you don't know? I thought you would, you're the one who sent me back in the first place. Oh really? It asked, snarling. And why would I send you back in time? What purpose would it serve me? We were dying, fool. Naruto hissed, I made a stupid mistake that cost me my life. I trusted someone to follow the same moral rules I did. And guess what? It cost us our mortality. Then what happened to me? It roared, obviously furious that the boy had survived and he, apparently, had not. I shattered the seal. Naruto yelled back, it was time to vent all his frustrations. You promised to activate my bloodline and send me back as soon as the seal was broken. Why? Because, either way, you were going to die. The only way to stop it was to prevent it. And how did you do that? You sent me back in time so that I could stop that day from happening. But if certain events change too drastically, then I'll be stuck without any knowledge of what is to come. Then I'll send you back again. I don't care how many times you travel through time, you will not lose to a second-rate fighter, it shouted back. I don't care, just get out there and fight. No, Naruto said, glaring furiously at the caged beast. The beast glowered at him, then I'll force you. Red chakra flooded from beneath the barred gates, engulfing Naruto wholly. Gah, Sweden, Zabuza and Kakashi said together. Swear you. The masses of water that had begun to form loose, draconian shapes suddenly splashed back down into the lake, destroyed by a lack of concentration. No one paid any notice, though. No, everyone's focus was on the figure by the lake edge, who was surrounded in an angry red chakra aura. The aura shifted and twisted, 
morphing into a humanoid, fox shape. Two tails protruded from the cloud of energy, swaying as though they were real appendages. RRRRRAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAA
and draped his left arm over her shoulders, intent on carrying her most precious person for however long she had to. Hanada wrapped her right arm around his back to support his weight, allowing her more mobility as well. In her own eyes, she was finally being useful to her crush. Sasuke tried to remind himself that he was still alive by taking deep breaths. He was rattled by what he had witnessed, and, frankly, this new side of Naruto was frightening. He had trouble believing that his best friend could wield so much raw power, and was scared that it would corrupt the blonde. He resolved to ask Naruto what had happened when he felt the time was right. Until then, things would go back to normal for him. Tazuna was, odd, there were few better ways to describe exactly how he felt. When he had first set eyes on the small, spiky-haired boy, he had thought this Naruto kid was a pushover. He had feared that the boy would be the weakest link in the Team 7 chain. But after seeing the boy mop the floor with an elite, he knew he was in good hands. So, his heart lighter, he set the pace for the trek to his home. Kakashi could only lament on the events of the day as Tazuna led them to his home. He had picked apart every detail about the fight and had come to the conclusion that the QB had not been in control of his student. Naruto's movements had been wild and instinctual, his body acting on reflex and impulse alone. The QB would have done much more damage, and the QB would certainly have torn Zabaza's corpse to shreds in its bloodlust. Naruto had done no such thing, having backed off as soon as Zabuza was confirmed to be dead. That was another thing on Kakashi's mind. He knew that Zabuza had survived. He didn't do anything because he didn't have enough energy left to tackle a hunter nin who was half his age and probably twice as strong. Had he had enough information to assume that the hunter nin was Zabaza's accomplice, he would have let Naruto handle the problem. But, until the ninja had left with Zabaza's body intact, Kakashi didn't have enough data to declare the young boy an enemy. Thus, Zabuza and the boy had escaped and fled to fight another day. Kakashi shook his head, this was why he had quit the Anbu Black Ops. He had wanted to get away from the tangled web of lies and foul play that had plagued his missions. He had wanted to get away from the two-pronged deceit and the vicious half-truths that could cripple entire nations at a time. It was too tiring and pointless. It seems that bad feeling of mine was not unfounded. I hate it when I'm right. Hiyashi sighed as he watched the setting sun from his personal garden. It had been another trying day, and he was glad that he finally had some measure of peace. Being the head of such a prestigious clan wasn't as easy as it looked to be. Hanabi was progressing greatly in the art of Jukin, and it seemed likely she would surpass her sister quickly. Normally, that would mean that Hanada would be sentenced to the branch family, but, because of Hiyashi's little arranged marriage for Hanada and Naruto, for the elders to do so would breach a very important Hayuga law in the Hokage's trust. Hiyashi had to smirk at that. He had won up the stingy old people on the elder council. The elders were very angry with Hiyashi for betrothing his oldest daughter to the QB's vessel, but they couldn't do anything about it, since the documents were signed and locked away in the Sandime's office, with duplicate forms in Hiyashi's private study. He chuckled as he remembered the obscene threats and curses the elders had thrown at him, only to have their words fall on Hiyashi's deaf ears. Neji, though, Hiyashi felt a weight settle in on his heart, pulling at the strings wound so tightly. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't mend his relationship with his nephew. It was one of the reasons he tried to keep the branch family genius away from Hanada as much as possible, so that the boy didn't try to harm her in some sparring match or other. He knew that Neji placed most of the blame for his father's death on Hanada's shoulders, and the fact that Hanada was close friends with Naruto only increased his nephew's loathing for the girl. There was another thing on Hiyashi's mind. Even though it had been roughly seven years since his brother had died, he still missed him, and his heart ached for what had happened. The pain of his wife's death was greater, of course, and no one could really compare to losing the comfort of someone as close as a spouse, but his brother's death plagued him so much because he could have done something about it. Could have prevented his sibling's untimely demise. Leaves from the vine, falling to slow. He or she smiled bitterly as the lyrics rolled off his tongue. Like little, tiny shells, drifting in the foam. It was something of a lullaby that his mother had sung to him and Hazashi when they were only boys. Now, with most of his precious people gone, this song held a strong sentimental value for him. Brave little soldier boy, come marching home. Brave soldier boy, comes marching home. A lone tear fell slowly from his eye, rolling solemnly down his cheek. Seasons come and go, passing so slow. Like little, tiny shells, drifting with the flow.
Hiyashi felt water gather at the edge of his eyes, waiting for his barriers to crumble, so that they might fall freely. Little soldier boy, come marching home. Brave soldier boy, comes marching home, Hiyashi collapsed forwards, arms resting on his knees as he sobbed into his sleeves. So long, for so long he had retained a mask of apathy and sternness. Now, in this most private of places, shielded from even the Byakugan, he could drop it. Just for now. As consciousness swept over Naruto, a delicious smell wafted into his nostrils, his nose twitching reflexively. Even before his eyes opened, Naruto could feel his mouth salivating. A growl met his ears, and with a slight bit of embarrassment, Naruto realized it was his stomach. Slowly, his eyelids lifted, revealing twin sapphire orbs. His gaze traveled and, as Naruto had dreamed for the past few years, Hinata's porcelain skin and lavender eyes were the first things that he saw. A smile twitched across his lips, he felt truly loved. A smile lit up Hinata's face as she saw his eyelids flutter open, mirroring his own peaceful grin. She only wished that he was waking to her face under less stressful circumstances, but, as her luck would have it, such was not to be. They were in the middle of an A-rank mission, which meant that things could have been much more peaceful. But, regardless of what was happening around them, and the circumstances that had placed them where they were, Hinata smiled down at him and said, Good morning, Naruto-kun. Gently, Naruto rose, his head pounding. With the pads of his fingers, he massaged the sensitive temples on the sides of his skull. The blow he had taken from Zabuza was taking its toll on him. With a little help from Hanada, Naruto stood from his comfortable bed, clad in a pair of cotton pajamas that he had packed. Though awake, Naruto still felt very drained, so Hanada had to half carry him to the breakfast table. Despite this, there was no awkwardness, no embarrassment for either of them, well, except for the obvious feelings one experiences around his or her crush. Kakashi looked up as they walked in, his eye arching upwards, good morning, you too. Nice to see you're up, Naruto. Naruto nodded, one arm slung over Hanada's shoulders, the other holding the side of his head, how long was I out for, sensei? Kakashi shrugged, buttering his toast, only about a day, it's something of a miraculous recovery, seeing how hard you hit the tree. Naruto nodded again, sitting down in between Hanada and Sasuke. Sasuke tossed him a worried look, but he just shook his head and grinned. Not much could keep Naruto down, regardless of how hard he'd been hit. Zabaza's still alive, Kakashi said. Somehow, he had managed to down three pieces of toast without anyone catching the slightest glimpse at what was beneath his mask. Naruto mumbled an acknowledgement, shoving a large amount of rice into his mouth. He'd figured as much, thanks to the unsatisfied growling coming from the farthest corner of his mind. There was very little else that the QB could be upset about. Anyway, Naruto looked up. Kakashi was wiping his masked mouth with a napkin. Since all of you know the correct chakra exercises, as soon as you're better, Naruto, all three of you will start your own training. Despite his fast healing abilities, it was still a few days before Naruto was at his best again. With his chakra restored and the pounding in his head quieted, Kakashi had taken the three genin out into the woods, where they would begin their training. Now, Kakashi stood in the middle of the clearing, hands on his hips. Let's. Kakashi was interrupted by a kunai that whizzed past his head and embedded in the tree next to Naruto. Kakashi's eye was wide, and the rest of the team had their mouths dropped open. None of them had noticed the kunai until it had flown past the gray-haired junin. Naruto took the initiative and tugged it from the tree, pulling off the note attached to it. The note said. Come to the next clearing alone. We need to continue your lessons. Himura Shisho, Naruto's eyes widened and he crumpled the note, letting his chakra set it on fire. No one else could read this, lest they find something they shouldn't. I'm going to go train on my own, sensei, Naruto said, jumping into a tree at the edge of the clearing. There are some things I need to practice. Without another word to anyone on his team, he left them, heading in the direction of where the kunai had come from. Why Himura had followed him on his mission was a mystery, but if his shisho was calling, then it would be very near to Boo to ignore the man. It took him nearly half an hour to reach his destination, despite running at his full speed. But he knew it would be worth it. Himura was a great teacher, and his lessons had paid off against Zabuza quite well. When he landed in the clearing, Hamura's back was to him, a bag hung over his shoulder. As soon as Naruto touched the grass, though, his shisho turned around, 
dropping the bag carelessly. Naruto would usually have had a bit of trouble understanding why, but, as soon as the bag hit the ground, he didn't need to ask. Why? Because it left a foot in a half deep crater. Naruto began to sweat a little as he realized that whatever was in the bag was probably for him. And if crater was any indication, Naruto gulped nervously, his mouth suddenly dry and his palms soaked. If the crater was any indication, Himura seemed to notice Naruto's discomfort, a smirk creeping onto his lips, don't worry, Bakadeshi, the weights in that bag are for you, but you won't be training with them on, at least, not for today. Naruto let out a relieved sigh, relaxing a bit, then what are we doing today, Shisho? Himura closed his eyes, his hands clasped together behind his back, today, we will be furthering your ability in the hidden Mitsurugi style of Kenjutsu. But, but, Naruto sputtered, you just said we wouldn't be training today. And we're not, Himura interrupted. But that doesn't mean you won't be learning. He picked up the bag and tossed it to Naruto, who fell under the unexpected weight. He smirked again as Naruto struggled to lift it. Take off yours and put those on. Naruto obeyed, shrugging off his own weights and pulling out, nearly identical bands. The weights Himura had given him were small black bands, no bigger than his forearm. Several different seals were stitched into the fabric, but the thread used to make them was Siddhartha Gray, that one would be hard pressed to notice them. Upon closer inspection, Naruto found something folded into the inside. He pulled it out on each of the two forearm weights and realized that the bands were actually, cloth samurai bracers, no different than the ones Himura wore. He shot a questioning glance at Himura, who nodded. Naruto apprehensively pulled off the strap-on sleeve and the bandages that covered his arms, slipping the bracers on and looping the small thongs over his middle fingers. They fit perfectly, not too tight, but snug enough that they wouldn't slide up and down as he moved. Himura went through some hand seals, and suddenly, Naruto's face faulted under the new weight. With no small amount of effort, he stood again, straining to keep his balance. Those weights are made heavy by a ninjutsu hybrid, Himura explained, his expression unchanging. In order to release this jutsu, you need only use a certain three seal combination. Tatsu, Uma, Tora. To reapply the jutsu, you need only reverse the seal order, and the amount of weight will be determined by the amount of chakra you use. Now, put on the other set. With difficulty, Naruto picked up the second set, and almost fell down again as he realized that the second set weighed as much as the first set. Still, Naruto wasn't one to give up, and, after about 10 minutes, had managed to strap the other set of weights, which were simple bands, onto his shins. Panting, he looked back at his shisho, so, will these affect the ground I walk on in inanimate objects? Himura shook his head, as long as they remain on your body, they'll only affect yourself and other people. If you take them off and let them drop to the ground, then they'll affect your surroundings. Himura sat down on the grass, his legs crossed, Indian, style, next, meditation. Anyone within 500 yards of that clearing could hear aloud, what? Naruto walked sluggishly into Tazuna's house, his feet dragging and his arms drooping. All eyes turned to him, and he gave them a weak grin before he fell flat on his face, too tired to do more than groan. Hanada was at his side in an instant, trying to lift him from the floor. She found it quite difficult. The extra weight that clung to his arms and legs made him too heavy to carry, and, even with Sasuke helping her, she was very unsuccessful. With his students unable to pull Naruto from his bed on the wooden floor, Kakashi stepped forward, making a show of pretending to lift his sleeves. With a low grunt, he hefted Naruto into his arms, carrying him to bed. There was one night that Naruto would never forget, whether it was the original or this new version, which was influenced by his different experiences. He had been slightly surprised that he had been around for it, but some higher power seemed to want him to do certain things. And this particular night appeared to be one of those things. It was quiet that night. It was that kind of quiet that sneaks up on you before you realize it's there. It was that kind of quiet that makes just want to scream, and pull your hair out. It was that kind of quiet that just presses down on you, trying to crush your skull and shatter your ribs. Sasuke was inhaling his food, desperately seeking energy for the next day's training. Despite his new light-hearted, carefree personality, he still sought revenge against his brother, Itachi. And to take his revenge, he would need strength and skill. The only way to achieve those was to train, so that's what he did. Kakashi was eating at a slower pace, unconcerned with replenishing lost energy. 
several condiment bottles and other objects were set up around him, hiding his face from view. He needn't regain his strength, since the only one of his genin that could tire him out would be Naruto, the stamina freak. And Naruto trained by himself. Hanada ate at a subdued pace, shooting worried and admiring glances at the blonde sitting to her left. She was worried about him. She knew he wore weights all the time, she did too, thought they were nowhere near as heavy. But Hanada knew that before they left Konoha, Naruto's weights weren't anywhere as heavy as they were when she tried to pick him up that first day after training. If something was wrong, Naruto's hand rose up shakily, bringing his chopsticks to his lips. His muscles were so sore. Every day, once he got used to the current weight resting on his limbs, Himura Shisho would increase it quite a bit. Naruto would admit that learning these new techniques was awesome, but the price he paid to learn them was pretty high. Naruto's gaze traveled around the table, and he noticed, for the first time ever, that most of the food they were eating could be bought on a child's allowance. His brow furrowed, his lips forming a thin line. Tazuna-san, are things really so bad? The bridge builder stared at Naruto, sorrow written on his features, yeah. The old man sighed, for once looking his age, things weren't always so bad. Inari wasn't always so reclusive and cold. Everything was peaceful and pleasant. His fist clenched, then he came along and ruined it all. If he hadn't set his frigid sights on our little country, things would be great. But he had to ruin it all. He took our money, he took our freedom, he took Inari's father from us. The entire Tazuna family froze at his last words, each for their own reason. The old man himself froze because he just realized what he had said. Tsunami froze because she was concerned over Inari. Inari himself froze because the words of his grandfather had caused a pang of anguish and fury to cut through his heart. The dishes at the table clanged lightly as the young boy slammed his chopsticks down in front of him, his eyes invisible behind his hat. He stood abruptly, his head down and his arms tense at his sides. Without uttering a single word, he turned on his heel and ran from the room, leaving the rest of the people there to look at his retreating back. Kakashi, with his mask on, turned to Tazuna, Tazuna-san, what happened? Tazuna turned away, a grim, sad look on his face, it's best you don't know. Suffice to say that Gedu killed the courage and bravery of this village. And in the same day with the same person, Inari lost the most important thing in his life. Naruto laughed mirthlessly, at least Inari had a father. Mine died before I could know him. Seeing his distress, Hinata reached out and squeezed his hand reassuringly. She blushed lightly when he smiled at her and squeezed back. Standing and bowing, Naruto said, Excuse me, Tazuna-san, Tsunami-san, I've lost my appetite. Soundlessly, he left the room, Hinata following him a few short seconds later. Sighing, Tazuna went back to his food, I wonder how long it is until they figure it out. Chuckling good-naturedly, Kakashi said, It all depends. When will Naruto figure out that Hinata likes him and he likes her back? It might take a while. Day after day, for nearly two whole weeks, Naruto showed up looking in similar shape, sometimes with cuts and other times with bruises. Sometimes, he was in good enough shape to eat with everyone else, but, more often than not, he would show up at Tazuna's door tired and aching. Eventually, the day came when Naruto could not wake up with his team. Kakashi, with Tazuna, Hinata, and Sasuke in tow, left for the bridge, leaving Naruto behind with Tsunami and Inari. Barely ten minutes later, as the group of four came upon the bridge, a gruesome sight met their eyes. Bodies littered the bridge, bleeding and broken. Machinery was bent and twisted unnaturally, hinting at something more than human being the cause. It was the sight of a massacre. Splotches and puddles of blood followed the motionless corpses, staining the smooth concrete and dark wood red. Appendages were protruding at odd angles, obviously broken and smashed. Only a monster would be capable of such a thing. What the hell? A thick artificial mist rolled in, even as the words rolled off of Tazuna's tongue. Soon, most of the carnage was obscured. Ha, 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 a dark voice chuckled, echoing from within the fog. Long time no see, Kakashi. I see you still have those brats with you. But it seems the blonde one ran away. That's too bad. Two figures appeared from the depths of the mist, one tall and imposing, with a huge sword on his back. The other small and compact, a mask hiding his or her features from the world. After all, Zabuza said, smirking behind his bandages, I had a score to settle with him. 
Naruto awoke to the sound of a crash, jolting from his bed. His was on his feet in an instant, slipping his clothes on as quickly as possible. Kya, Tsunami's scream echoed throughout the halls, speeding up Naruto's dressing rate. Mom, Naruto heard Inari cry, with fervor and amazing agility, Naruto tore Masamune from its sheath and nearly busted the door off its hinges as he left the room. He seemed to fly down the stairs towards the source of trouble. When Naruto landed in the hallway, he could distinctly hear the two samurai conversing about how many hostages they needed. One of them, the freaky looking one with the eye patch, grinned as his partner confirmed that they could kill the little boy. In the blink of an eye, Naruto was upon them, his sword carving into the freaky one's flesh. A diagonal wound opened up, starting at the freaky one's waraji right shoulder and ending at his left hip. It wasn't too deep, but it definitely hurt like hell. Zori advanced on Naruto from behind, but Naruto's keen senses and speed allowed him the first strike. He twisted around, bringing Masamune across Zori's stomach. That wound was deep, and most definitely fatal. With a solid kick to the injury, Naruto sent the second samurai flying out the kitchen window and into the yard. Waraji let out a battle cry as he swung his sword. However, like his companion, he was far too slow. Naruto spun around and leaned forward, catching the taller man's chest with his right shoulder. Masamune protruded from Waraji's back, slicing through the doomed man's stomach. With a sickening squelch, Naruto pulled his blade free and punched the man outside to join his comrade. Blood coated the silvery metal, staining it crimson. With but a twitch of his wrist, the blood flew from his sword, landing on the now messy wooden floor. Then, with a single, fluid motion, Masamune returned to its saya, its sheath. Naruto turned towards his two witnesses, his face stern. A second later, it disappeared, and a smile broke out onto his lips, good job, Inari. You'll make a brave man someday. His job done, he headed for the door. He would expose of the corpses first. It wouldn't do for Inari or anyone else to see the disemboweled samurai decorating the front lawn. Then, he would head over to the bridge, and maybe he'd be in time to save Haku and Zabuza. Naruto Nisen, Inari moved forward shakily. WH where are you going? Naruto ruffled Inari's hair the way an older brother or father would, if you guys were attacked, then the bridge will be, too. My friends will need my help. Inari nodded, he understood, he could understand now, why this boy was smiling all the time. He could understand why this blonde kid was so confident. And now that he understood, he was happy. Take care of your mom, with a grin, Naruto disappeared in a flash of black. A series of thuds echoed in Sasuke's ears as Sinban rained down on him. Even with his Sharingan, all he could do was dodge, and he found it very frustrating. He was an Uchiha, damn it, he shouldn't be having this much trouble. A sharp whistle fell onto his ears and he jumped out of the way again, managing to miss getting hit by the barrage from behind. Sasuke growled uncharacteristically, Bastard. I don't want to kill you, the masked boy's toneless voice echoed hauntingly. Just give up. Damn you, Sasuke snarled angrily, Go to hell. Do Ryu Sen, a familiar voice cried. A few of the mirrors shattered as debris from the bridge smashed into them. A grin lit up Sasuke's face as he caught sight of his savior, and he couldn't help the barb that slipped past his lips. You're late, Naruto grinned back, the tip of Masamune's blade hovering an inch above a crater in the concrete. His eyes were simple azure, and his clothes were definitely in better shape than Sasuke's. Sasuke's eyes flashed back to his enemy, each crimson orb whirling with two comma patterns. Just because Naruto had arrived didn't mean the masked boy wouldn't capitalize on the distraction it provided. Naruto dove forward at the mirror prison reformed, landing next to Sasuke. Masamune found its sheath once again, nestled in the delicate wood, a wave of Sinban fell upon the duo, forcing them back. Even with their speed, a few had managed to make nicks and cuts, something that surprised Naruto especially. If he was correct, then Haku was even stronger than last time. Naruto dearly wished that he could activate his Sharingan, but he couldn't make it known to anyone but his teammates or else Orochimaru would seek him out too. This match was going to be close, he could tell. His eyes flicked over to Sasuke, who was making hand seals. Naruto flung his hand out to stop the boy, wait, Sasuke. That level of Kaden won't work on these mirrors. Taking his advice, Sasuke halted his seals, moving into another ready stance. Things were not looking too well for the Uchiha cousins, but everything would work out. 
Naruto just knew it. Haku took advantage of the distraction, plowing his shoulder into Naruto's stomach. Naruto, who had been lost in thought, was unprepared to block it. The wind was knocked from his body, and he went flying backwards, landing somewhere near the edge of the ice mirrors. Sorry, Zabuza, Kakashi said, pulling his Hitai 8 up, exposing his Sharingan, but I have to end this now. The ex mist Nin chuckled, Sharingan, is that all you can do, monkey boy? Zabuza chuckled darkly, hee hee, a shinobi's supreme technique is not something that should be showed to the opponent over and over. Kakashi interrupted him, you should feel honored. You're the only person to see it twice. And there definitely won't be a third time. Zabuza wasn't phased, hey, even if you beat me, you'll never beat Haku. He's even stronger than I am. Kakashi snorted, there's nothing as boring as a man's bragging. He he he, I figured out the trivial system of that eye. Ninpu. Karigakur no jutsu. Sasuke's eyes moved towards his cousin, worry in his gaze. Haku saw this, and took advantage of it. While Naruto was down, he dashed towards the boy, and, just as he planned, Sasuke rushed to intercept his attack. Naruto's eyes flew open as a loud crack rent the air. He looked around to find Haku on the ground, with Sasuke barely a few feet in front of the blonde, standing over him protectively. He was wheezing, and had quite a bit of trouble standing. Naruto caught Sasuke as he fell backwards, spent. M my cousin, Sasuke's voice was hoarse and scratchy. My best friend, my brother, don't die, Naruto, or I'll kill you. Naruto slowly set Sasuke down, careful not to add to the damage already in place. He knew Sasuke would be fine, he knew it wouldn't be fatal, just as he knew that he'd find some way to win this battle against this stronger Haku. Haku rushed towards the blonde, catching him off guard, this is the end. Naruto-kun, a sound met Naruto's ears, a sound Naruto never wanted to hear, a sound that tore Naruto apart, a sound that could send Naruto on a killing spree that even Gara would be jealous of. A wet squelch sounded as Haku's weapon dragged itself across Hanada's neck, severing a very vital artery. Even as a thousand possible ways to repair the damage crossed his mind, Naruto knew it would never work. For the first time in this second chance of his, Naruto felt his heart stop. In an instant, he was by her side, forgetting the opening in Haku's defense as the masked boy tried to stand again. To many, Naruto seemed to have used some sort of teleportation. One second, he was next to Sasuke, the next, he was by Hinata's side. Before she even hit the ground, Naruto had caught her, trying desperately to stem the bleeding. When he realized that he was unsuccessful, he let the tears come, burying his head in the crook of her neck, where the wound was. Shish. He heard her whisper in his ear. I I have something to tell you, Naruto-kun. Anything, he mumbled into her clothes, his salty tears dripping into the wound and mixing with her blood. Aishiteru, Naruto-kun. Naruto's eyes snapped open and his breath caught in his throat, her words reverberating in his ears. He felt joy and despair mingle in his system, but he was so caught up in the whirlwind of emotions that he didn't hear the hiss of her wound closing and disappearing. He stood as her breathing slowed, not wanting to have to bear hearing it stop. Rage and hatred soon filled his being, calling for Haku's blood in return for Hanada's. He couldn't find it in himself to care about setting the future right anymore. For him, there was no future without Hanada. His pulse drummed in his ears as his anger grew, threatening to consume his entire being. I can help you take revenge, a deep voice whispered seductively in his ear. Just do what I say. Against his better judgment, Naruto found himself making the hand seals the voice had told him to do. He couldn't bring himself to care about it anymore. The only thing that mattered was taking his revenge, and that's what he was going to do. Ninpu. His voice roared, penetrating even the thickness of the mist. Kuchio's no gongan. There was silence for a few seconds, then the world disappeared around Naruto, leaving him standing in a black emptiness. The dark expanse seemed to stretch on forever, nothing but emptiness surrounding him. He didn't know where he was, but he sensed a power somewhere deep within this antimatter space. He wanted that power, he wanted his revenge, and this strange power would let him have it in the sweetest way possible. The entity of power seemed to hover, as if looking for him, and he suddenly understood what was needed. He pulled the chakra from his body, both his own and the cubies, and shoved it forward, creating a beacon for this entity to find him with. Three red orbs suddenly appeared from the darkness, glowing as they stared at him. 
They were in a triangle formation, and seemed to see right into his soul. I have found you, a deep voice echoed, originating from the orbs. The world, which seemed to have stopped as soon as the words left Naruto's mouth, lurched into motion again as red and blue chakra shot upwards from Naruto's body, creating a giant pillar of light. Everyone shielded his or her eyes. Gua, a low growl fell across the bridge. Kakashi gasped as he gazed at the leviathan that towered over the wooden concrete. There was only one word to describe the thing that Naruto had summoned. Amazing. It stood tall, three red orbs for eyes set in a triangular pattern that stared down at Haku. A thin, crescent moon-shaped object was attached to its forehead, the ends of it stopping above where a normal person's ears would be. Its head was round, bereft of everything but the object on its forehead and the three crimson orbs. Its shoulders were concealed by two pieces of skin or whatever it was that covered the beast. Beneath these pieces of skin were some solid objects, which were actually yellow horns that protruded from the beast's back. Its arms, though long and lanky compared to its body, were scrunched up, and, like most of its body, pitch black. Its fingers were pointed, like claws. Its legs weren't fully extended, and were probably incapable of doing so. Spikes protruded upwards from its knees, as if protecting the beast's thin torso. It had no feet, and its shins were scrunched much like the arms, ending in points. To top off its frightening look, a sort of cape made of red chakra fell down from its waist and covered the backs and sides of its legs. Guruwa, it threw its upper body back, as if stretching after a long nap. Even as heavy as it had to be, it still floated above the water of the river ocean that ran beneath the bridge. Haku trembled as it leveled its red gaze at him, leering as best it could without a mouth, nose, eyebrows, or the ability to change its facial expression. Guru, Kakashi was frightened and surprised. This creature was clearly larger than Gamabunta. Hell, Kakashi was willing to wager it was bigger than the QB, and much more frightening as well. What had been most scary about the demon fox were its size, power, and killing intent. But this creature was topping the demon in all three. What the hell? Zabuza shouted, Tazuna fell backwards, onto his rear. This thing was scaring him beyond what he believed possible. His mind was screaming at him to run, but his body just wouldn't respond. It was like a train wreck. You wanted to look away, but you couldn't, for some reason. The beast seemed ignorant of everyone but Haku, and slowly lowered its hand, grabbing the boy. Haku struggled against its iron grip, but to no avail. His fate was in the hands of this beast, and things didn't look too great for him. He waited anxiously for the creature to tighten its grip and crush him. But it never came. Suddenly, Haku was plummeting for the bridge, his life spared thanks to the diverted attention. With a quick flip and a little chakra, Haku landed safely on the bridge, turning his eyes towards the beast's target. His eyes widened. Replacing him in the creature's hand was Gaidu, his arm broken and his voice screaming desperately. The rogues who had been with Gaidu were throwing spears and other weapons at it in an attempt to free their employer, but they were unsuccessful. Nothing pierced the beast's rock-hard hide. There was a sickening crunch, and Gaidu's cries suddenly ceased, his body limp. Silence settled over the bridge, the reality of the event much too surreal for most. It was only interrupted as Gaidu's body fell into the water with a resounding splash. With a blinding flash of light, the creature disappeared, leaving Naruto lying prone where he had first summoned the beast. His chakra was spent, and he was too exhausted to stay awake, let alone move. He fell into sleep hoping that he would rejoin his dead love, Hinata. Kakashi pulled his Hitai 8 down, glancing over to Zabuza, who looked somewhere between happy and disappointed. Disappointed, because he wouldn't be getting paid, and happy, because the slime ball known as Gaidu was dead. Do you want to finish them? Kakashi asked, gesturing towards the remaining enemies. Or would you mind sharing? I've got some frustration to vent. You're too confident, Zabuza chuckled. You know just as well as I that we don't have the chakra to take all of them on. Hey, hey, one of the rogues shouted. You killed our meal ticket. So now it's your fault we have to pillage the little town at the end of this bridge. Kakashi and Zabuza moved into battle stances as the group began to stalk forward, towards the tiny village in Wave Country. With their superior numbers, it looked like Gaidu's thugs would manage to overcome the ninja and make good on their threat. An arrow suddenly landed a few feet in front of the lead, rogue, and every conscious person turned their eyes towards the beginning of the bridge, where it had come from. There, 
Clad in makeshift armor and carrying all sorts of kitchen and farm utensils, such as pitchforks and shovels, were the townspeople, glaring menacingly at Gaidu's hired muscle. The rogues took one more look at the odds, then turned tail and ran back to the boats they had come in. Taking on a few ninja wouldn't be too hard. They'd lose a lot of good men, but they'd have won in the end. But when you add in the people of the town, there was no way that they'd make it out alive. When Naruto woke up, he was glad to find Hinata hovering over him, worried about his well-being. After all that had happened, he had thought her to be dead, and that had scared him more than any enemy ever could. He didn't want to think about life without Hinata. Neither Naruto nor Hinata mentioned the words spoken on the bridge. It wasn't for lack of trying, they just never had the privacy to do so. Tsunami and Inari were always checking up on them to make sure they were okay and that their injuries were healing properly. Naruto was relieved to find out that, not only were Haku and Zabuza alive, but they would be joining Konoha. They were going home with Team 7, and they were going to become Leaf Nin. They were tired of life on the run. Two weeks later, it's all thanks to you that we've completed the bridge, Tazuna told Team 7, ruffling Inari's hair affectionately. Thank you for your hospitality, Tazuna-san. My team and I hope to see you at the Chunin exams. I'll make sure have an escort sent out for you, Kakashi said, smiling through his mask. With a single, backward glance, Team 7 and their new companions turned around and left Wave Country, heading home to Konoha. They had gained many new friends on this journey, and they would gain many more. As they headed down the road that would take them home, two members of the Team 7 entourage fell back, so that they could start their long-awaited talk. Hanada-chan, Naruto said quietly, did you, really mean what you said? Hanada blushed, poking her index fingers together, Anyo, why yes. She blushed a darker red, one that Naruto was sure she had invented upon the spot, I I do love you Naruto-kun. W with all my H heart. Aishiteru, Hanada-chan, Naruto smiled, lacing his fingers with hers, Sesha wa kanza shitiru dezu. Sor care wa dezu. Naruto leant over and gave her a peck on the cheek, watching as she turned an even deeper shade of red, this one is very thankful. Naruto's gaze drifted towards the sun and his smile widened. That he is. Next time, things heat up as Naruto learns what it is he summoned. Oh, this just screams, Kyubi. What secrets is the demon fox hiding from the world? What was the creature that Naruto met, and why did it say, I have found you? That's definitely not normal for a summon. Shut up. I'll kill you, Gara makes his premiere appearance, too. And it seems Shukaku is uneasy about something. What could that insane raccoon be muttering about? Are his ramblings even credible, or is it just some wild goose chase? Wait, what, a written exam, ah, shit, that's so boring, though. And what's with Anko, will Naruto be able to avoid Orochimaru? Next time on a simple change, the Sharingan, the terror of death. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. The next part will be out soon.